going to cause embarrassment for those who, who should be embarrassed. It is a two-faced game. The pot is going to break soon. Some new information here. For the past three years, we've examined evidence of a terror support network in Tampa Bay and claims that a key U.S. ally, Saudi Arabia, is secretly funding the terrorists. They essentially are the creator of ISIS and its primary source of financial support today. If that's true, why would our own government cover that up? We may find the answers in 28 pages of secrets that may soon come to light. It needs to be explored. It needs to be explained and it needs to be resolved. Plus, as Governor Scott talks about health care for the poor, we found a few things that do not add up. We're not going to implement Obamacare in Florida. We'll be looking at that over the next few weeks. Yeah, I don't, you know, I don't remember saying a few weeks. I don't think that's what I said. I'm not going to stand in the way. I'm not going to support it. And in the race to the White House, we'll show you why Donald Trump says the game is fixed, what's playing out behind the scenes, and how Trump could be working the ultimate art of the deal. This is Money, Power, and Politics. All right, thank you for joining us. We have a full lineup tonight, and we will start with the Republican Party establishment trying to take down Donald Trump. But conservative, working-class white voters are still rallying behind Trump. And Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist Charlie LaDuff shows us why with the Americans this week from upstate New York. We've become weak. We've become weak. There is a class war among Republicans. In an attempt to explain the populist appeal of Trump, the Manhattan billionaire who lives in a golden skyscraper, writers for elite Republican magazines have been mocking a hypothetical working-class white man named Mike. This make-believe Mike hails from a real-life upstate New York hamlet called Garbit. They describe Mike as a typical Trump voter, an out-of-work welfare cheat, high on Oxycontin, who's abandoned his kids. Instead of whining about Wall Street and trade deals, they write, Mike ought to put down his heroin needle and move to a place where there's work. The truth about these dysfunctional downscale communities is that they deserve to die. Economically, they are negative assets. Morally, they're indefensible. Imagine. Big talk from behind a keyboard. So we decided to physically go to Garbit, New York to find Mike, since working class white people like Mike are half the Republican voters. First, it's hard enough just finding Garbit. But you know where Garbit is, by any chance? Uh, I have no clue, to be honest. You know anybody named, in Garbit named Mike? What they need around here is real opportunity, which means they need a real change, which means that they need a U-Haul. If you want to live, get out of Garbit. So I say, what the hell are they talking about? That's insane. So Garbit's just up that way? Yeah, And once you find the crossroads of Garbit, about 20 miles south of Rochester, you quickly realize there is no Mike from Garbit. I don't think there is any Mike in Garbit. There's not a Mike? Not, not that I know of. I don't know everybody, but... No Mike? No Mike. There's no Mike from Garbit. There's a Kevin, whose dad's name is Mike, but no Mike. So let's settle for Kevin. You use heroin, Kevin? No. Um, you miserable? Not really. No, I'm a nurse myself. You're a nurse? You actually work? Yeah, and I actually used to work for General Motors before that. You used to work for General Motors? Yeah, before he moved to Mexico. Kevin, in fact, works two nursing jobs, but still earns less than he did at GM, where he made windshield wiper motors, like his father did and his grandfather before him. There's a lot of struggling people like Kevin in New York, a state that's lost hundreds of thousands of good-paying factory jobs overseas. Xerox, GM, Kodak, Corning, Bausch & Lomb, to name a few. Good thing there's cheap imports at Walmart because Kevin can't afford anything else. Okay, where, where, where's that watch made? Well, it's probably made in China. What's it say right there? Philippines. Made in Philippines. It's a nice shirt you're wearing. Well, that's probably made in China. Is it? Oh, big, big and dash, I believe. Let me see here. Vietnam, bro. Vietnam? Yeah. Vietnam. Everything else. Where's them shoes made? Let me see. Those are chosen, probably China. Let me see. Let me see. Indonesia, bro. Indonesia? Yeah. What about your, your, your pants? Oh, those are probably China. Let me see the tag. Let me see. Indonesia, bro. Yeah. Seems to be the place, huh? 
Uh, when I was a kid, a lot of people used to hunt out here. You know, the, they don't hunt anymore. Despite what the round-shouldered writers write about people in their own party, Kevin says World Trade and Wall Street have done nothing to improve his life. And so he looks for something new, however crude and obnoxious. I probably got to end up voting for Trump. You know what I mean? How come? Well, he's hitting all the right spots, you know? I mean, except for sometimes when he screws up, you know, he's like a poor... It's not like he rehearses things. We, we need jobs. They got to be back here. We need manufacturing back in the United States. I mean, all the jobs are gone. I mean, Kodak fell apart. I mean, I just know from my area. Kevin doesn't draw a government check, doesn't do drugs, and doesn't even keep beer in his fridge. He is, however, a single parent raising a teenage son, and the son, named Junior, will graduate high school next year and join the Army. Why do you want to do the military so badly? Serve my country. Never made people plan on doing it. What do you think of your old man? If he wasn't sitting here, what would you tell me? <laughs> what would you tell me about your dad? Be a good, hard worker. Well, going for nursing and everything, coming from a factory, that was probably hard. I love you, I look up to you. Coming from raising me single parent, that gonna be not one easy. Well, I just want the best what's best for you. You know, I'd rather have you go to college for a year or two and you still want military to go that route. Town, country, family. That's how it goes in places like Garbit, New York. And it would do the political establishment some good to get out of their office towers and visit places like Garbit instead of mocking a man who only exists in their imagination. What have the Republicans done for you? Uh, I don't really know, to be honest with you. Being a Republican, no, yeah. Okay, I really can't answer that. Belittle a man, you lose him. You lose his son, and you lose your party. Well, Charlie's traveling across the nation for us as the race plays out. He also spent a week right here in Florida and Tampa Bay along the I-4 corridor. So you can subscribe to our YouTube page. That's Craig Patrick's Money, Power, and Politics on YouTube to catch up on the people, the Americans, and the stories that you may have missed. Coming up. The fix is in. They're picking people who are not for Trump. Trump and his supporters claim party bosses have rigged the system. So what does that mean and what might Trump have up his sleeve? Republican strategist Adam Goodman has an interesting theory. Then we have our continuing investigation of terrorism and links to Saudi Arabia and Florida. Donald Trump could tank in a contested convention because some of his own delegates appear to be double agents. Party insiders appear to be picking delegates for Trump who hope or plan to vote against Trump in a brokered convention. What they're trying to do is subvert the movement with crooked shenanigans, all right? Well, party leaders say it's not crooked because they're following their own rules. And Ted Cruz has outmaneuvered Trump by focusing on the process of selecting delegates. In other words, Cruz is getting his loyalist on the convention floor while Trump is getting hosed. And Trump supporters claim it's happening right here in Florida where Trump won big. The fix is in. They are going to, we're going to lose a brokered convention because they're picking people who are not for Trump. Trump supporter Debbie Mick claims she watched party officials choose delegates for Trump who intend to betray him. In Florida, you're bound by the first three votes, and everybody said it's going to go past three votes. They already told us they're going to sell out, flip. They are not for Trump. They're for Rubio. Well, many voters don't realize they don't really pick the delegates. Local parties do. Then the second district uh, of delegates that they picked were Cruz supporters, known Cruz supporters. Meanwhile, journalists with Politico say they found 100 other delegates who plan to break from Trump whenever they can. It's a fix. And that's why Trump says he's getting cheated. I'm hundreds of delegates ahead, but the system, folks, is rigged. It's a rigged, disgusting, dirty system. And so let's bring in Republican strategist Adam Goodman on that note. So Trump is saying it's a dirty system. <laughs> You're a Republican. Is it dirty? Well, it is the system, and a lot of people are down on the system right now. It's a referendum of sorts on, on what it has been, and Trump owns that narrative right now.
And you're developing a very interesting theory that <laughs> while he complains in public that he's working something behind the scenes, maybe the political deal of the century. I think so. If you were to read his book, Art of the Deal, in fact, you can just read the Monarch Notes version of it, you really get a sense that that's exactly where this thing could go. If Trump's going to be denied, uh, if he doesn't get to 1237, and as you can hear from the last week, Craig, a lot of behind the scenes maneuvering on delegates and are they going to stay true to what they should stay true to in various states. Uh, if he looks like he's not going to make it, I think he cuts the deal of the century. He may look to Ted Cruz uh, and say, Ted, look, I, I'm not going to make it on the first round. And frankly, the establishment will turn around and make sure you don't make it in the second round or the third round. Let's pull together because right now we had the chips, most of the chips on the table. Why don't we play them? They're both outsiders. Uh, you see how quickly also, Craig, that uh, Donald Trump has gotten over, you know, uh, his, you might say, his engagement with Marco Rubio and others. Now he likes everybody again, Scott Walker. I think the same could be true here, and it could become the political deal of the century. But with Trump at the top of the ticket, I assume, how does he sell that to Ted Cruz? Ergo, the deal maker of the century. He is a great deal maker, and I think he has more, he will have more delegates. There's really more reason for him to be able to say that. But if both of them say to each other, look, we're both outsiders, we're going to be left in the dark here and out on the outside looking in if we don't pull together. And the greatest strength they've got will be on round one, ballot round one. And I think, uh, I expect Trump is already having those conversations internally, if not starting to think about how he's going to have that face to face with Cruz at some point soon. And there could be uh, even a, an unspoken arrangement or deal or understanding that maybe Donald Trump is not going to be a two-term president. Uh, and suddenly you have Ted Cruz that might have an open field four years later. And it's not too late for them to come together. I mean, voodoo economics, uh, <laughs> Bush attacking Reagan is one thing, but I, I seem to remember Ted Cruz calling Trump a, a sibling coward. Well, Donald Trump was going to say what he said before already. This is just politics. And uh, I think they would get over it and they would say this is for the good of the country. That's how they'd rationalize it. Based on your theory, do you think this is already taking place behind the scenes or is he going to roll this out in, in July? Well, I think they're thinking about it. Right now, there's still a possibility that Donald Trump could get to or beyond 1237. He's on a roll right now. He's going to win New York and win New York big. I think he continues to roll into California uh, about six weeks later. He may just make it. So I think that is a card he will save until after California when he sees where the numbers are. And then work the ultimate art of the deal. It could be the ultimate art of the deal. Interesting Correct. theory, Adam. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Greg. Coming up, we could have a bombshell in the war on terror that leads right through Florida. We have claims of treachery, cover-up, and 28 pages of secrets. Without exception, when they have put down the 28 pages, they, their reaction has been, oh my God, I can't believe that uh, this has really happened. Nearly 15 years after Osama bin Laden struck America, our government is still keeping secrets. For the past three years, we've examined claims that a key U.S. ally, Saudi Arabia, funded and supported the attacks. And we found evidence of a terror support network right here in Florida and Tampa Bay. And the classified records that could prove it may soon come to light. The pot is going to break soon. They're necessary. Former Florida Governor and Senator Bob Graham says the public has been blinded. He co-chaired the congressional investigation into the September 11th attacks. And when congressional leaders released it, they said there was something in there they couldn't tell us. But at the moment, I do not think the whole story is out there. This is especially true with respect to references to sources of foreign support for hijackers. President Bush and then President Obama blocked the release of 28 pages that only a few members of Congress have seen. And without exception, uh, when they have put down the 28 pages, uh, they, their reaction has been, oh my God, I can't believe that uh, this has really happened. Graham says those pages have been locked away because they show who helped carry out the attacks. And though he can't discuss specifics, he claims the Al-Qaeda attacks were secretly supported and funded by the government of Saudi Arabia. And he suggests Bush and Obama may be keeping it secret to protect our oil interests or our alliance with the Saudis. We provide them with security and they supply us with a guaranteed source of petroleum. 
Well, Florida Senator Bill Nelson said he can tell us that the Saudis play both sides without seeing the full report. I don't have to declassify the, uh, the pages to tell you that the Saudi government and many other Middle Eastern governments are quite duplicitous. It is a two-faced game, and this is particularly egregious with Saudi Arabia. But a growing number of Republicans and Democrats in Congress want us to read the full story behind September 11th for ourselves. I strongly believe that these pages contain information that is vital to a full understanding of the attacks on 9-11. Declassify these pages. But there's no reason to classify it anymore. I am embarrassed that they're not declassified. This is going to cause embarrassment for those who, who should be embarrassed. So this week, Fox News asked if President Obama had even read the mysterious 28 pages, and White House Press Secretary Josh Earnest couldn't say. Uh, I, I just, I don't know whether or not he's... Uh, you haven't had a chance he, to he, ask he, him. I have not asked him about it. But after that exchange, Graham said he connected with the White House, and it is now reviewing those 28 pages, and the president will decide whether to release them within the next two months. It needs to be explored, it needs to be explained, and it needs to be resolved. Convicted terrorist Zacharias Massawi admitted to planning the September 11th attacks, and he testified that high-ranking Saudi officials helped bankroll al-Qaeda. The Saudi government strongly denies it. Please like our Facebook page for our 30-minute special focused on this investigation. That's Fox 13's Craig Patrick on Facebook. Also, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Just search for Craig Patrick's Money, Power, Politics. Click subscribe and get caught up. President Obama says interesting things can happen in the fourth quarter of one's term, and we're seeing some very interesting changes right now in his poll numbers. So Evan Axelbank is here to show us what's going on. Barack Obama has been bashed relentlessly by Republicans. He has admitted that he's failed to bring people together, and he's seen his legislative priorities fail. His party even suffered huge losses in 2010 and 2014. But here is Barack Obama, the comeback kid. His approval rating was in the low 40s for much of 2014, and now it's back over 50% for the first time in three years. That's pretty helpful for the Democrats because that reduces the number of uh, voters who disapprove of the president that the eventual Democratic nominee is going to have to you know, convince to vote, vote, for, vote for them. The turnout is really important, particularly in some states that have uh, significant African-American populations, including, including a state like Florida, uh, but also a number of the Midwestern Rust Belt states that are swing states. As a point of comparison, George W. Bush's approval rating seven years into his presidency was in the low 30s. And look what happened to the GOP in 2008. Every race is, of course, different, but Barack Obama's rising approval is certainly a cautionary tale for Republicans. Coming up, we fact check Governor Scott's claims on health care and show you the part he's leaving out. Scott may want to forget the lashing he took at Starbucks, but he kept it going in the news cycle another week because he could not stop responding to it. You cut Medicaid, so I couldn't get Obamacare. With regard to Medicaid expansion, it's a federal program, and I've always said if the federal government wants to pay for their program, they should go ahead and pay for their program. And that's where we have to call out the governor, because that's not exactly what he said. I cannot in good conscience deny Floridians that needed access to health care. Let's go back to the day the court gave Florida the choice of whether to expand health care for the poor under Obamacare. Whether we uh, can afford to expand Medicaid, um, but we'll be looking at that over the next few weeks as we look at that opinion. Then later that same day, he went on our same network and said that he had already decided to block it. And when I called him on it, he just denied it. We're not going to implement Obamacare in Florida. How and why did you change your mind on that? Well, I didn't change my mind at all. We'll be looking at that over the next few weeks. Yeah, I don't, you know, I don't remember saying a few weeks. I don't think that's what I said. Then, as Scott prepared for re-election and polls showed voters favored the Medicaid expansion, Scott suddenly appeared to have a big change of heart. Expanding access to Medicaid services for three years is a compassionate, common sense step forward. He said expanding Medicaid then was a matter of common sense, but notice he never said that he would act out of common sense. And after he won, he revealed that he had no interest in expanding health care for the poor. Are you going to push for Medicaid expansion in some form or another? I'm not going to stand in the way. 
That's what I've said. Well, he meant he wouldn't have to stand in the way because he would do nothing to get it going in the first place. But the Republican Senate took I won't stand in the way to mean something else. So you're telling me there's a chance. So Scott had to explain by he won't stand in the way. He means that he will totally stand in the way. I'm not going to stand in the way. I'm not going to support it. To recap, Scott said he would take weeks to decide something he had already decided, then oppose federal money to help poor people until he needed their votes, at which point he invoked the memory of his departed mother and said that accepting federal money for poor people was a matter of compassion and common sense. Then after he won re-election, he fought it tooth and nail. Governor Rick Scott believes transparency matters. Now, the last time I pointed that out, the governor's press office called me to complain because I noted Scott's prior support of expanding Medicaid without noting his condition that it'd be fully funded by the feds for three years. But when I said, wait a minute, wasn't the Senate plan that he opposed also fully federally funded for three years? And that's when his spokeswoman clammed up. <laughs> Look, I've, we've, I've always given you all the facts. Why won't you answer the question, sir? And so his lashing at Starbucks, as disrespectful as it may have been, took off on social media, and that's why it keeps going the more our governor responds to it. Last question. Why do you think you have a reputation for not answering questions? Oh, gosh, I answer questions. Well, that's a wrap, and thank you for watching Money, Power, and Politics, and have a good week.